This episode of Hello PhD is sponsored by Promega and listeners like you. Thanks for your support. Well, what types of things would we talk about if we started some kind of podcast? I assumed it would be three topics. We'd talk about bad advisors, <laughs> terrible advisors, and criminal advisors. <laughs> Welcome to Hello PhD, a podcast for scientists and the people who love them. This week, we revisit our motivation for starting this podcast and start dreaming about the next five years. Stay with us. And we're back. This is Hello PhD, episode 141. I'm Joshua Hall. I'm Daniel Arneman. And we'll discuss the human side of science and life in the lab. Hey there, Dan. Walk down memory lane today. Uh, as as usual, I was going to ask before we get too far into this, Josh. Your kids have finally started back to school now. I think. Yeah, we are. We're like three or four weeks in at this point with uh, virtual yeah, school. Here. So I'm enjoying in my spare time picking up a second job as a third and fourth grade teacher. That's been pretty great. You remember how to do long division? Because I'm going to need a refresher. I just uh, plug it in my calculator. <laughs> that's that's the trouble. That's what I've done for the last 100 years. Yeah, my kids have been attending this this Montessori type school and the way they teach math is, is really interesting. It kind of breaks things down into these visual fundamental blocks and which is not how I remember learning <laughs> math at all. It's kind of like, oh, well, just memorize. Not even close. Yeah, like memorize what it is and that's how you do it. But really kind of crazy, like to see how it builds, how the steps build from what they learn as, you know, younger kids, kindergartners, first graders. And it's very easy for them to kind of make the conceptual uh, steps as they advance on in in math. And I don't know, it just makes me wonder, like, why didn't we all learn math (laughs) that way? It's a great question. And uh, I don't know that there's an answer. And, And you could argue, since we know how to teach it, with these concepts now, and probably did 30 years ago when we were in school, uh, why why isn't that the standard? And uh, I guess the answer is the teachers aren't learning it that way to teach it, right? I have no idea. Yeah, I don't know either. And, and you know, it's, it's very much not high tech. No, it's all wooden blocks and beads on a string. Yeah, I mean, and an example of this is like when they are really young, just starting out with math, they might have beads that are in groups of one. And then they have another chain of beads that's in groups of two and then three and then four. And they count these. And what they're really learning is they're learning multiples. So by the time they start learning, oh, what's three times four, they already know how to visualize these. Oh, well, on the chain of three beads, when I have four groups of three, that's 12. But then what's crazy is you see them, they have these three-dimensional shapes, right, that are made up of the same beads. And maybe it has a cube they already know, oh, that's just another dimension. There's this many beads and it's times this other beads. I don't know, it just makes sense. It's uh, pretty yeah, impressive. It, it is incredible. It is a physical representation of math. And as opposed to being an abstract one, which is hard for grown-ups, but it's really hard for little kids to make those abstract leaps between the concept of a number and a physical object. So, so it turns it into something physical that they can use. I'm sure nobody tuned in today to hear about Montessori <laughs> math teaching. So we should probably talk about uh, the ethanol that is in front of me maybe nobody tuned in for that either but they're going to hear about it (laughs) they sure are well as promised we are continuing to branch out and try some different uh, types of beers today is no exception and so today dan we are drinking the surf melon and that is a farmhouse ale with watermelon sea salt and lime from oxbow brewing company in newcastle maine Uh, dan i want to say oxbow is it is you ox, would say oxbow? Is that I don't know. Is that what it's called? I was I would say oxbow, but I I don't know. Maybe well, I have it's a Pennsylvaniaism. I have not yet been to Maine, so I could be wrong. Okay, somebody from Maine, call us and tell us how to pronounce that. Um, this is a very. I saw the word farmhouse on it, and I got very excited. And I saw the word lightly salted, or the phrase lightly salted, and I was like, okay. So, what do you think, Josh? All right. Well, I want to I want to read the marketing speak for this one to you because uh, this beer introdu- introduced me to a some new beer terminology that I was not familiar with, and I wanted to to have a little beer educational segment here on the show, if that's okay. 
All right, so this this says Surf Melon is a gently salted grisette brewed with American hops, wheat, watermelon, and fresh limes. After surf casting is brewed and blended, we add watermelons, which is fully fermented out by our house saison strain. Hazy straw in color with juicy notes of fresh watermelon, lime zest, lemon peel, and white pepper with a dry, lightly tart, subtly salty finish. All right, well, that sounds delicious, but what jumped out at me was this word grisette, because that was not a term I had encountered before. How about you, Dan? I have not encountered the word. I don't think I've seen grisette. I'm led to believe that it has something to do with the color gray, though, because the French word for gray is gris, which is G-R-I-S. How far off am I? Well, that could have something to do with it, but not in the definition that I located. Uh, in the context, okay. fail. In the context of beer, at least. So, um, in the context of beer, crusettes are a subset of a slightly better known farmhouse style ale, the saison, which I love. I, I do too. And so, the this style of beer has apparently a very complex history. Uh, but to, to summarize. The uh, saisons were originally brewed to quench the thirst of seasonal farm laborers. So translated literally, saison means season, which is a nod to the fact that the beer was brewed in the winter to be enjoyed in the summer. Uh, but of course, there's a wide variety of, of saisons. But I think that's also, Dan, why you tend to see saison paired with this term, which is on this can too, uh, farmhouse ale. Uh, but an important aspect of all saisons are their dry, refreshing nature, which also happens to be the defining characteristic of a proper grisette. So crisp, medium light bodied, citrusy, endlessly approachable. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm still hung up on the etymology here, as you should expect. <laughs> the first result, if you type in the word grisette in Wikipedia, is for the person grisette, which is a French working class woman from the late 17th century, named because... They wore cheap gray fabric uh, in their dresses. Well, there you go. So I wonder if these seasonal laborers were French gray-dressed people. Maybe they wore gray. That's, that's, my, that's my theory. I'm trying to save myself, Josh. It could very well be, Dan. Let me tell you what I think about the beer while I've got your attention, yeah. though. First thing, of course, you get the salt. It's, it's like right on the tip of your tongue, salt receptors. The first thing I taste is melon. So there is that kind of sharp melony flavor. But it... It fades or melts into another flavor that I think is a combination of the saltiness. There's like this vegetal taste or kind of um, a flavor that I couldn't place for a long time, and I have just figured it out. It tastes like nori, the seaweed oh. wrapper that, mm -hmm. that you eat those little like seaweed snacks. See if you get it. And it's, it's not a smell. I don't think you'll smell it. I think it's like after the melon fades, it tastes like this uh, sort of salty seawater flavor. You know, th that could be Dan. I don't know that I'm picking that up. I have to say, I don't like this one at all. Mine maybe sat in the back of the car longer than yours. <laughs> when I nose this beer, uh, I really get essence of a sour beer, which I don't always appreciate. But on the show in the last few years, I, I have encountered some, some sour beers that I do appreciate. Uh, this is not one of them. Uh, when I taste this, Dan, I have to be honest, it harkens me to, it makes me think that I'm eating a watermelon right after I brushed my teeth. Oh, that is, that is not <laughs> high praise, Josh. I, I just get this sharp, I do get the melon essence initially. I'm like, oh, this is going to be melon. Great. I like melon. But then immediately it's followed by this almost sharp, focused, bitter uh, taste that I am not a fan of. I don't, I don't know what that, and not, not like a hoppy bitterness, Dan. You know, I like a bitter beer. I can handle that, but I don't know. Something about it for me does not, it doesn't it's blend off, well. It's off flavor for you. It is, but well, you can't win them all. You picked it, Josh. You, yeah, you can't blame me for this one. While people are still listening, hopefully uh, they have visited promega.com slash hello PhD. Uh, right now, we are putting up some of the information on, on the webinars that we've recorded. There is one that Josh and I did, was it a year ago, Josh, where we went to Wisconsin and recorded a webinar with Mike Morrison on... Uh, how to present a poster. I believe that was back in fall 2019, Dan, when we were traveling together and going out for meals and beer. And tr yeah, wow, it was a different, different time. Times. You're making me reminisce uh, so eating can, cheese curds. Yeah, you can you can revisit us in, in freer times by going to promega.com slash hello PhD. Click on the resources tab at the top. You'll see a list uh, uh, for webinars. 
And under the student resources section, you can find uh, that one about scientific posters or one about writing about science, tips and tricks for communicating your research. So check those out. I think that webinar where we talked with Mike about how to make a better poster, really focusing your poster presentation down to its key ideas, could be a really beneficial way to approach a poster now that conferences are moving more online uh, to these sort of e-poster scenarios where really the visual of your poster is just uh, helping you get the conversation started. So might be worth now checking out. Now I can out. zoom in and read all those tiny words <laughs> in, on my screen. Instead of listening to me, you can zoom in on my, on my highly detailed poster. All right, Josh. Well, let's get to today's topic, which is a revisit of why we chose to pick up this podcast in the first place. All right, Dan. Well, as we mentioned on the last episode, we unceremoniously, I think we almost forgot that we passed the five-year podcasting mark. And we decided... No, we are no longer toddling. We are no longer toddling. We have started a podcast kindergarten where we are learning Montessori math. <laughs> <laughs> Look forward to the next five years <laughs> where we learn division. I can't wait. But we thought one thing we could do today is five years was a long time ago. And to have a show that the target audience really focuses towards science trainees, towards graduate students, although I know we also we hear from listeners who um, are undergrads or postdocs or even faculty. If you were a grad student who started listening to our show at the very beginning, you hopefully, likely aren't a grad student anymore. And some of our newer listeners uh, maybe missed out on why in the world we're doing this podcast in the first place, what our motivations are in keeping this going for five years. So we thought it might be interesting to revisit some of the things we said five years ago and see if they still hold true today. That's right. And and for the people who are maybe just tuning in recently, Josh and I talked about having a podcast like you do for, I don't know, two or three years before we actually started it because you know, I had I had had such a terrible experience in graduate school, and Josh and some of my other friends in that period of time were very very supportive. Uh, and I think Josh, you had a better experience. But after we had been out for a little while, and you were working helping students transition through this process, we said, "Well, we should ju- we should talk about this because it's so isolating. It's so difficult to be a new student and go through this." But it took us a, a few years till we decided actually, there's enough here to talk about and here we are five years later so take us back to episode four josh uh dan first of all i want to say it has been a really uh, amusing walk cringy walk down memory lane as i went back and listened to episode four uh which i will say uh originally aired on july 26 2015 let me just dan can i just play you a clip of the the intro of the podcast back then do you have to (laughs) all right here we here we go Welcome to Hello PhD, a podcast for scientists and the people who love them. In today's show, we try to explain why the heck we're making a podcast in the first place. Stay with us. Dan, that's a that sounds so low energy. <laughs> welcome Were to we Hello asleep? P- <laughs> oh, welcome to Hello PhD. Hi. I have to say, we probably had a few more beers back then, out of <laughs> nerves. Yeah, it is worth re- worth remembering, Dad. I mean, we've now done this 141 times, but uh, we used to get really nervous w- before we would start recording yeah, these. Absolutely, not anymore, Josh. Not anymore. And you know, I think there's this there's this adage for recording. Uh, we are not radio people. We are not professionals by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but one thing you do discover is you need to sound when when you're recording something audibly talk about four times more enthusiastic than you think you need to. And then you come out sounding normal <laughs> when you listen back. But yeah, we, <laughs> the passion level uh, was much higher in our hearts than it sounded on that recording. Well, and you'll hear some differences. You know, we, we tweaked the uh, intro a little bit. We have, we've been fairly consistent with the introductory remarks. People can probably say them by heart if you've been listening a while. Um, but in that one, we only got to, explore the human side of science and nothing oh, yeah, else. Yeah. we didn't yeah, have yeah, yeah. life in the lab things yeah, were different want, actually this was the the other part that amused me right off the bat so i want you to hear this part of the intro as well 
Welcome back, and thanks for joining us as we peel back the layers on the science and research world. I'm Joshua Hall. And I'm Daniel Arneman. And we'll do our best to explore the human side of science. Dan, how are you doing this week? I'm feeling very well. Thank you. What's new in your world? Um, we have an a exciting beer this week. I love that, Dan. We'll, we'll try our best to explore the human side of science. <laughs> we may not succeed. <laughs> I'm glad we ditched the peel back the layers. That just, I don't know, that doesn't we're work like, for me. We're like Shrek. <laughs> oh, I just love that lack of confidence. Exactly. Well, okay, so so humble beginnings, Josh, and, and humble current situations, I suppose, but the the reason that we are talking about this again is to remind some people that maybe haven't heard that episode uh, from five years ago why why we're doing it and and who you and I are and our backgrounds so that they get a sense for um, just the the passion and the interest we bring to this. Yeah, Dan. And one of the things we discussed on that show was, was how we met. That's a question that I get from time to time. Is so how do you know Dan? Did you connect just to do this podcast? And I say, oh, no, 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 no. We, we go back a little farther than that. But for those who don't know, we actually met in grad school. And really before that, we met on our grad school interviews at the University of North Carolina where we ended up going to grad school. It was 2002 or three. What year was it? February 2002. Maybe March. March 2002. Okay, and and these were the days when, and then, does this still happen, Josh? Uh, we got to stay in a nice, fancy hotel. We got taken to dinner repeatedly. We got drinks out at the fancy <laughs> bar that we never could afford when we were grad students. Do you do, you do all of that still? Uh, well, typically, yes, but this year, no. But um, aside from COVID, yes, that, that still happens. And uh, I think in previous episodes, we've talked about the, the grad school interview process, but, but that's, how, that's how we met. And, and particularly one, one period of time during that interview weekend stands out and I think really shaped even how we do, how we format the show today. And it was towards the end of the interview weekend. And we were at one of these bars, like you mentioned, Dan, we were at a, a brewery called Top of the Hill Brewery in Chapel Hill. Um, and we were up on this open balcony. It must have been a, it must have been a nice warm night because we were sitting outside with a few of the other recruits and you and I, who had just met, were sitting there over our beer, discussing things like how the interviews had gone, uh, the faculty we had met, and what was playing, what was going through our mind as we were trying to make decisions about where to go to grad school. Yeah, it was toward the end of the interview season, and I know there was a lot of consternation because we were all being expected to make this decision. You have to, you can only go one place. Um, hopefully, you got offers from multiple, but not always, and the decision you make to accept an offer somewhere was going to change the outcome of your whole life, if, if I recall correctly. Uh, if you go to school A, then you're probably going to get a great postdoc and become a faculty member and publish papers and be famous. And if you go to school B, <laughs> you know, you might end up on, you, you finish in 12 years and you never get a job and you work at uh, a bookstore for the rest of your life which actually sounds more appealing now than it did at the time. <laughs> but but like there there really was one great choice and one terrible choice, uh, but it was completely opaque in that moment. Yeah, well, and I don't think, you know, I think even in, on that night, Josh, the choices were so similar. Um, I remember specifically you were, choos- and, and I was choosing between two schools, both of which were really great schools. And it was coming down to things that weren't, is this program a uh, well-reputed program it was coming down to do i want to live in this city do i like the people who i interviewed with who are likely to be my uh classmates do i like the research that's going on in these departments so it was less about i guess is my future going to be okay and more about all of these things you can't measure and they're heart-wrenching to make these decisions because you're you may be excited about both but you have to say no to some of them yeah you're absolutely right and they were very important decisions and we, you know as i reflect back on that evening a few things are clear to me. One is, I mean, really how little we knew, <laughs> how little perspective we had, right? And we're trying to make decisions with the information we had available to us. But but the other was, I felt like, at least Dan, that there weren't a lot of places to turn to get some guidance and to get some advice. And, you know, so many things 
that we talk about on this show, one of the big reasons we want to discuss those things is there are lots of these really hard, complicated decisions and, and things that you face during your scientific training. But the reality is many, many, many people are also facing similar challenges or have previously faced and overcome and maybe have some really valuable insight uh, to help you through those things. And I don't think that was something we had access to back then. Well, I think it would have been very difficult. Podcasting was not what it is now. There were blogs. Everybody had a blog. But for you to find, I feel like to find somebody consistently talking about the process of graduate school in a blog was difficult to do. And I think even if the if the information had existed, even if the conversations were happening somewhere that were accessible, I don't think they were very easy to find or to consume week to week. And so all of this was happening. Everybody was going through it, but it was hard to plug into that conversation. Well, and I would say too, Dan, that back in those days, there wasn't a lot of thought or energy or resources put into helping graduate students have a better, more rich, more holistic experience, <laughs> training experience outside of working in the lab. Yeah, I think it was it was better than it had been 10 years prior. I think there has long been a history in graduate training of sink or swim. Um, I think it had started to improve by the time we went through, but it has definitely gotten better now. Is that what you're trying to say? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And, and I would say, Dan, even since, even in the five years since we started this podcast, I think there has been a continued movement in... PhD programs, especially in the sciences, to have more of a focus on uh, student mental health and student wellness, on career, on broadening definitions of successful career outcomes and career awareness during training, um, um, things like that that weren't necessarily a focus, um, certainly when we were in graduate school, but I think even, you know, five to 10 years ago. Um, one of the things, Dan, beyond the interview time when we met, of course, we ended up going to the same graduate program, and, and that's really where our friendship formed was during graduate school. And, and I think maybe that's why it's very natural for you and I to continue to have conversations surrounding uh, grad school and science training because our friendship was really forged around that time and discussing issues like this. You know, there were many times post uh, in that interview weekend when we would sit together with ourselves and with some friends who were also going through the process, just trying to figure this stuff out and just trying to keep our head above water at times, uh, you know, to celebrate with each other in our successes, but also to wipe the tears and offer advice, you know, during the many challenges that we all face too. And I think that's something we wanted to keep going and make sure that others had access to uh, that type of support as well through their own training. You know, Dan, I think one piece of our, our Hello PhD history that's kind of interesting is that we didn't really consider starting this podcast, all that being said, of how we spent a lot of time discussing these issues as grad students. It wasn't until quite a bit later uh, that we were into our careers that we really discussed starting this podcast. Um, one, I'm not sure if that's because podcasts weren't were yet invented <laughs> at that time. I can remember, Dan, this was probably seven, eight, nine years ago, you and I sitting down at dinner and discussing, I really, I mean, discussing kind of a topic like we're getting to now where, you know, at that time I was in a career in academia where I was um, spending a lot of time with graduate students and supporting graduate students. And we were having a conversation about how I had observed that grad students at that time and today we're really struggling with a lot of the same challenges that we struggled with when we were graduate students, that a lot of the issues were really the same. And it seemed unfortunate to me that grad students were still struggling with these same issues. And I wish there was a way to better connect them with that knowledge that one, they weren't alone, but there might be others who have gone through some of those challenges before them who might have some real words of advice. Yeah. And I think that was the key insight for me after I got out of graduate school, I tried not to look back. Um, and I think a lot of people, even if it was a positive experience, you don't spend a lot of time worrying about what happened to you before. You spend a lot of time worrying about the next, the postdoc, the paper, the whatever thing is coming up. And when you said that, you know, I think you told me a story, some student came and, and experienced something and, uh, basically you were able to talk to them about things that, that we had been through as graduate students and that helped them. 
And I think the key insight was that conversation with that one student helped that one student. And what would it look like to have a conversation that could help 10 students or 50 students or a thousand students? And, um, you know, so much about, about how my experience in graduate school was such a, a, a strain and a pain on my mental health that when you kind of propose this idea of having a conversation more publicly uh, and, and said, maybe this could help more students who are going through that pain that I had gone through, I thought, well, yeah, we have to. We have to make this better for the people going through now. I think a key next step in that process was was at that moment, and this is a very typical thing of you, Dan, you pulled out a I think you pulled out a, a napkin or a sheet of paper or something and said, okay, well, well, what types of things would we talk about if we started some kind of podcast? I assumed or... it would be three topics. We'd talk about <laughs> bad advisors, <laughs> terrible advisors, and criminal advisors. And then we'd be done. It would be a three-episode podcast. Well, yeah, I think that was initially a reaction was, well, are there really enough things to talk about? And so... You you really said like what are the topics and we yeah I, I said prove it to me can can we get ten shows out of this or thirteen and I forget how many we wrote down that night but it was probably thirty I think it, it had to have been at least thirty and so we had right there in front of us wow there's at least in ten or fifteen minutes we came up with thirty different topics that would be uh, important to talk about on the show unfortunately somehow we misplaced that napkin or that piece of paper and it was another two years, I think, at least, before the first episode of Hello PhD actually got released. I had a child in that time frame, which is, <laughs> I was just trying to do the math on how old my son was at the time when we actually got around to starting it, and he was two. So I assume that in that intervening period, I lost a lot of things and never found them. Yeah, that's a good point, too, Dan. I guess I added a couple children. Uh, I guess that was really a hectic period of time in both of our lives. Um, but that was really the, the impetus for, for starting Hello PhD. And, you know, one of the things, Dan, is I went back and listened to five years ago why each of us said we wanted to do this show. So, yeah, would you like to hear five years ago why you said you wanted to start the show? Is it as exciting as the intro was? Because I'll take a nap. <laughs> I think you were warmed up uh, by 15 minutes into the show. Here, let me play this for you. Hit me. So, Dan, why why are you doing this? What's important to you about doing this? Um, for me, it was a very, very hard time. And it was a hard time because it seemed almost unending to me. So I had made this decision to go to grad school, and I wanted to do it for such a long time. But when I got there, it didn't turn out to be what I thought it would be. And so I found myself in this program where my options were either, you know, leaving without a credential that I, I had worked a long time to achieve or staying and being miserable for an unknown amount of time. That was, that was so difficult, the uncertainty for me. Um, and so I made it through and, and I'm out and I have the degree and I quickly... Um, moved on to doing what I consider my life's work, the thing that I love to do. Um, and, and what I want to be here for is to be able to cast my eye on on what it was. And because I'm not part of it directly anymore, I can say when things don't work. And I don't have a, you know, I have nothing to lose. I have nothing to risk. Um, so I can be that voice. And, and I can also be the voice that says, look, it gets better. So whatever you're going through, it gets better, and and there are things you can do to make it better. And so it's important to me. If one person hears this, and they're having a hard time in grad school, and they get a piece of information or something that helps them get through that, totally worth it. All right, Dan, do you still feel that way? I do. I'm going to shed a tear for past me. <laughs> and and I, Josh, what's so exciting to me is that we have heard from some of those people now, some of those people who have, they started when we started, and they have graduated. They've made it through the program they say they listen to us while they're in the tissue culture facility. They listen to us when they're uh, developing their gels. They listen to us on the bus on the way to the campus. They've told us that some of the questions that we have talked about are questions they've had, and it's helped them not necessarily to have an answer, but to at least feel that they're not alone in the decision. And hopefully we've given some advice that has helped. Um, and, and that's what people tell us. So five years on, I couldn't be happier about what we've been able to do uh, being part of that part of that process part of their lives 
And you say, would you say that's the main thing that keeps you going? Why you keep doing this? That is absolutely the only reason to keep going <laughs> is to make it better. Yeah, I think that's great. Dan, would you like to hear why I said I wanted to do this podcast five years ago? I would love to hear it. So what are you doing here? It could just be me. Um, I know how to run the soundboard and turn the computer on and things like that. Vaguely (laughs) useful. I think I approach it from a a little bit different perspective. So I'm still on the inside. I still work in academia uh, very closely with science trainees. And a lot of my job uh, is to work with students whose goal it is, is to go on and research. In some ways, I guess I'm still um, an evangelizer for science, right? Um, And so, you know, I think at this point, I've gained a lot of perspective and knowledge about the science career path. I work a lot with students uh, thinking about careers. Uh, But one of the things that's become very important to me is that science, this science community, the science environment, is as inclusive a place as it can be. And one of the things that I've come to see is that science is really for a lot of people. And science is a very interesting place. It's a place where you can experience extreme personal growth, intellectual growth. Um, You can just learn a lot. You meet a lot of interesting people. But it hasn't always been equally open to everyone. And so one of the things that I've really become passionate about is making science a better place. And so when that sort of folds into why we want to do this and some of the things we want to talk about here, because as Dan, you were talking about, you know, your ability from the outside to have this perspective to look back into the research world and say, these are some things that didn't work. These are some things that actually aren't the best for people who are going through the the science training process. Yeah, I will ask some hard questions because I, I'm not trying to achieve some of those ends. Yeah, and I am. And, you know, I'm on the inside wanting to work to actually try to change some of these things and make science a more open place, but also make science a better place for the people who are, are inside actually doing it. All right, Dan, that was our walk down memory lane. Still true for you, Josh? Yeah, I think so. And it was really interesting. I haven't heard that for for years. Uh, It was really interesting to hear this discussion then, five years ago, about desiring science to be a more inclusive place. Um, I know that's something that's been on, you know, in the forefront of our minds in our topics we've had here. But I think uh, the scientific enterprise in general over the past few weeks and months. Um, so to hear if that's something we were talking about in a real uh, focus and goal five years ago was was interesting. But, you know, that passion, that motivation that I had then is definitely still there now where we had seen, had witnessed so many people we knew, whether they were friends of ours going through the process or I think it was very clear to me working with students then in my job where I would see people leave science because, not because they didn't like doing science anymore, uh, but because there was something about the process or the system or the structure or uh, that, w- that really pushed them out, that forced them out. And I think that broke my heart. Like that, and that just seemed very unfortunate for them, for their life, but also just for science, like for the world, for their contributions. When you have someone's passion, they're pushed off that path because of something that I saw should have been avoidable. Um, I don't know. That was something I felt strongly to push back against. It was a problem in the process, not in the fit between the person and, and scientific research. That's right. And if there's anything that drives me, professionally at least, it's this desire to change the process. If it's broken, if academia is broken, let's fix it. Let's change it. And I've been pleased in some ways to, I've been reflecting this week over, well, have things changed at all in five years? Because in a, to a certain degree, five years is a long time, but in another way of thinking about it, five years is not very long. And, you know, I think back over the fact that over the past five years, the GRE has gone away, right? That's a, a fundamental part of academia that was part of all of our selection process when we applied to grad school, um, at least in the biomedical PhD world, and now in a an ever-expanding uh, realm for graduate students in other disciplines, the GRE is going away. And just to remind people who maybe haven't, haven't followed that issue with you and with us, 
it's because the GRE is not a good predictor of success, but it is a great way to uh, limit admissions to people of privilege and of a majority group. That's right. And, you know, I think about also, Dan, just what we, we alluded to you earlier, that I think more and more programs and in more and more settings, graduate research settings, uh, there has been an increased focus and conversation on on graduate student wellness, mental health and wellness. Uh, there's been a lot more of a focus and resources put in by programs to acknowledge the fact that graduate students have a lot of different career interests and there are a lot of skills that need to be developed during training and a lot of really successful outcomes after graduate school that aren't being a PI at an academic lab or going to industry. I mean, really, Dan, when we were in grad school, I feel like the two career options we knew about, at least, that we were told about was uh, if you were really great, you would become a PI in academia and run your own lab. But I guess if you wanted to go to industry, that was like the other thing you could do. But now we don't just acknowledge that these other career paths exist, but there's more affirmation. We're more affirming of the fact that students have different interests and those are successes too, uh, postgraduate school. Well, and I know, I know, Josh, from a little bit of personal experience, you now have regular trainings and seminars for these alternative, quote unquote, types of careers. Um, a little while back, you invited me, we, you and I stood in front of a, a packed room of graduate students and talked about podcasting as a form of science communication. And and people were excited about it because it gave them, who loved science, but maybe didn't want to be a PI, a way to practice talking about science. And, and there's so much need for that in the world today that um, if, if you can give people the experience of scientific research training, but also training in communicating science, they're going to come out of graduate school and be so much better uh, at this skill that we really need in the world. So I know that was one example, but but you're doing this all the time now in the program. Yeah, that that's true. And and these are the types of, of voices and ideas that we have really tried to amplify over the last five years. Um, one of the things that I don't think either of us really wanted from the beginning was it just to be our voices. We don't have all the answers. Um, but, you know, I think back on all the amazing guests that we've had on the show. At some point, we should really tally up how many different guests have we had on the show in five years. But there are a lot of really innovative people who are thinking about these issues and pushing, you know, pushing things forward with, with how we train scientists. And I'm really excited about all of those different ideas that we've hopefully helped to amplify and put out into the world a little bit more, um, at least in the graduate community. And I think that's a big thing that keeps me going. I mean, still being in academia and in the science training world and working with, with science trainees at different levels, I've taken so many ideas that I've learned by doing this show, by talking to the people we've talked to over the fa past five years, that has highly influenced my own thinking and and has impacted the things that I'm doing, even in my own context. And I think that's my hope, too, is that some of these ideas uh, maybe have spread uh, to other folks that maybe wouldn't have uh, if it wasn't for for the show. I think that's really exciting. Yeah, we force learning on ourselves, don't we? <laughs> we uh, do. It's, it's not a bad thing. You want to make any predictions five years from now? What you know? So five years ago, the GRE was still still held sway, and now you can say it is on its way out, uh, particularly in the biomedical fields. Five years from now, what do you think is going to be the thing that that you're so excited has now changed? Wow, I almost think this I almost think this could be an episode in and of itself where we make our bold five year from now predictions and then we go back and open our time capsule. I want to bury it in the <laughs> middle of this one so nobody hears it. Uh well you gave me no time to think about this, so I'll tell you mine. I would like to see team based PhDs wherein multiple people are working together on a project rather than you sink or swim based on your first authorship. And I imagine you mean that as a as a rule versus as an exception. Uh, I think if we could see it some, I, I guess it exists in some fields. It is not very common in the biomedical world. So, so let's get to the same place the GRE is, where you can throw a stone and hit a school that doesn't require the GRE anymore. I'd like it to be relatively common, probably not everywhere, but uh, I'd like the option to be there and the recognition to be 
that science is a team sport. And so scientific training should be a team sport. Yeah, I think that's totally fair. And something that we, uh, you know, we've discussed on this show and ideas others have had is that that is probably for the best for trainees and for scientific discovery. Uh, No, I think that's great. I would love it if that becomes more true in the future. Tell me, tell me your prediction. Robot researchers. (laughs) Well, I have a couple. This, I don't know if this is more, I think this is going to happen, but these are a couple additional sacred cows of academia uh, that I would like to see, see killed. The first has to do with the qualifying exam. I think that's something that we discussed very recently on the show. We had some listener questions about that. I think qualifying exam is another hurdle in some departments that is an exit point for students. And in my experience, the students who are exiting are not necessarily exiting for the right reasons. And I think it's from program to program, it's not applied um, uniformly either. We've heard, we've even gotten some feedback from some programs that don't even have a qualifying exam and others that have a much higher failure rate. So I think high stakes testing in general, I'm very skeptical of. This is fitting for you because this is another way that people leave science for reasons that aren't because they're not good at science. That's right. I mean, the the GRE is one of those things, right? We're, We're initially excluding people that might be great scientists because we have this arbitrary set of tests that they need to take. And the same could be said for the comprehensive exam. It is a it is an unrelated skill set that helps you pass your comprehensive exam, uh, but you don't get to get your PhD if you don't pass it. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And, and in some cases, it may, you know, it may assess a much more narrow sliver of a skill set that could be related. And I think that's where it's so tricky. I think that's where we get so clouded um, by thinking it's important is because, well, it's related to research, so it must be important. Uh, But it's certainly not a holistic view of someone's potential as a scientist. Um, Very seldom is that the case. Uh, but But it carries a lot of weight in most programs. That could be your exit point right? Because you can't jump over that hurdle as presented. Um, so, th- so that's one. I think the other one that I would love to see is, and, and this goes, Dan, this actually goes directly towards one of the things that you mentioned in in our little time machine segment where you were discussing five years ago. I would like to see more clarity and standardization of time to degree. I expected you to say that. That is That is your <laughs> hobby horse. Yeah, I think that a common point of trepidation for graduate students in PhD programs is often this uncertainty about when they move on. And it makes for a very awkward transition to the next step. Um, and, And sometimes I think it can seem even arbitrary where you're trying to line up your job, you're trying to line up your next step, uh, but you're waiting on certain scientific discoveries, certain scientific results to come through and this committee to, deem when you're allowed to leave. And that is a great source of stress for a lot of graduate students. And I know, Dan, as you mentioned, you too, it's like, well, when am I even going to be done? And I think just by having a little more clarity and certainty about when the process is going to be over would actually be very motivating for for graduate students. Um, And I think the absence of that certainty of when uh, grad school is going to be over provides a lot of demotivation that that gets a lot of grad students mired down quite a bit. No, you're, you're preaching to the choir. It is the all or nothing end point. And the all comes only after an unspecified amount of time. So it is, it is intractable. It's an impossible thing to solve um, unless we, we set some time limits and gates along the way so that it's easy to see that a student is making progress. Maybe like a comprehensive exam partway through to let you know <laughs> that you're ready to graduate, Josh. No? Maybe. Maybe. We just we just had a test to let us know. Four comprehensive exams, one per year. <laughs> uh, how about you, Dan? Any other, any other final uh, predictions or wishes for the future? I absolutely hate making predictions because I am a person who uh, doesn't deal well with uncertainty. So I'm going to stop with the one I made. I predict the beer is going to get better next week. Can't get worse. Week. Uh, unless I do follow through on finding that Budweiser Zero. <laughs> Oh, no. See, I don't make predictions. Uh, Well, Dan, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't say the one other piece of of doing this podcast that I always look forward to and always enjoy is hanging out and drinking beer with you and talking about these issues, uh, just like we've always done. 
Yeah, it is a an excuse to get together, and I do appreciate it. For anybody who has been listening to us, with us, for the last five years, thank you. Uh, and if you joined recently or sometime in that period, we'd really appreciate it. We always ask, and, and we mean it, please send us your questions. Or if you don't have a question, send us an article you read or something that you've been talking about in your lab that is on people's minds. We want those conversations to to move into this space so that more people can join them. And so you may not have you may have the best PI and the best lab experience and you're doing great, but if you read an article that you think is compelling or interesting, send it to us. Um, you are the reason that we're doing it and you are the the stories that we get to tell and and the people we get to interview and talk to. So without you, we don't have a podcast and and we absolutely appreciate what you've sent us over the years. That's absolutely right. If it if it was truly just us, we would not still be doing this. So uh, thanks to everyone who has contributed and reached out to us and been part of this community for the last five years. Um, and if you had, if you've been listening since 2015 or so, uh, shoot us a message and let us know. I would be amused to know, <laughs> uh, inspired to know. I just signed my parents up this year, so they can't <laughs> even claim... I, I signed up on their podcast app so we get one more. I think my parents listened to the very first episode and that was their only one. And they fell asleep and never woke up because <laughs> it's so boring. Uh, but if you'd like to reach out to us, you can do so the way you always have. You can email us podcast at hellophd.com or you can send us a tweet at hellophd. If you enjoy the show, you can leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcasting platform. We certainly love getting your feedback. If you want to support the show, you can become a patron. Simply go to our website, hellophd.com, click the Become a Patron button, or you can visit patreon.com slash hellophd. We appreciate the beer money and the ongoing support from all of our patrons. Dan, this was warmly nostalgic. It's your favorite. You love trips down memory lane. I love nostalgia. I only wish we could have this conversation sitting on my back deck in person. I know. Well, it all started, I think, in the basement of my last house. Is that right? And someday we'll get back to... Your basement? (laughs) You sold that house, so... Yeah, well, we can break in and make it happen. (laughs) Maybe that had to do with the low energy as we were really in this uh, dimly lit, uh, damp basement. (laughs) Asphyxiating slowly. All right, Josh. Well, keep it up, and we will see you next time. See you next time. Welcome to Hello PhD. <laughs> <laughs>